Hello, apologies, I am in my dressing gown because it is Sunday and I just got off a reading sprint over with Shannon at 155 Books, Sylvie from the TBR for Diaries and Anna from Read to Me at Midnight, where I of course started on book three of Les Miserables. Les Miserables. Why can't I can't say that, like, why? But yes, I've just started reading part three, Marius, and during the reading sprint, I read books one and two, which are called, Book one is Paris through the study of one of its atoms and two, the consummate bourgeois. In book one, we get another one of Victor Hugo's digressions, but this time he is talking about the gamine. Basically, Victor Hugo talking about, I guess, what we would call like a little street urchin, the little boys and little girls who grow up on the streets of Paris with no families and are just trying to make it in this big grisly world. Him kind of talking about their innocence and their resilience, but also lamenting the fact that there are so many of these children who are growing up with just no love and no support. And and then he finally centers in on the main little gamine that we will be meeting, which is Gavroche, who we have met before. It's not been properly revealed within the narrative, but this is Gavroche, the youngest child, the only son of the Thenardiers, which is something he maybe would have only picked up if you had been keeping an eye on the different names. Once again, we're finding another way that Victor Hugo likes to use names within his books, this time in helping to build suspense and mystery, because the Thenardiers also go by the Jondrette, 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 Jondrette. John Jett. I I'm gonna put it here. This is this is their name. So he's kind of hiding the family within the text, but if you've picked up on that as a name, then you'll get it or you might recognise it on the second time round. And yeah, I thought this was a really interesting section. Victor Hugo seems to have so much respect and admiration for these children and how they are able to fashion a life out of nothing. But at the same time, he's very much not romanticizing them and is really criticizing our society for not looking after these children. Towards the end of this book, he says, to sum it up, the gamine is a playful creature because he is unhappy. There's no illusions about these children. It's not a happy romanticized childhood. And in Victor Hugo's eyes, this is Okay, racer. And in Victor Hugo's eyes, this is very much the product of a society who are completely neglectful, or particularly of their poor. The gamine is a credit to the nation, and at the same time, a sickness. A sickness that must be cured. How? By light. Light is wholesome, light is animating. All radiance of social beneficence emanates from science, literature, the arts, education. Create men, create men. Illuminate them so they may reflect warmth on you. The gamine embodies Paris and Paris embodies the world. Later on he says to portray the child is to portray the city, that these children are a reflection on Paris and the world as a whole. He kind of talks about how, though it may appear that these children have all the freedom in the world because they're not accountable to anybody, really they are very trapped because of their poverty. Paris, the center, the outlying districts, the parameter, for these children, this constitutes the whole world. They never venture beyond it. They can no more leave the Parisian atmosphere than fish can leave water. For them, five miles beyond the gates, there is nothing. And that's incredibly sad because that is not freedom. Not being able to venture outside of the city because you don't know how to survive there, that, that is not freedom. No matter how much you're able to run up and down the streets as much as you want. So once again, Victor Hugo very much talking about what is freedom. Do any of those really have freedom? The next book, book two, The Consummate Bourgeois. And this is just a short little section, just 10 pages where we are introduced to Monsieur Guillaumant. Guillaumant. I've not done French since year nine. Once again, I'm gonna put it here. Tell me how to pronounce that. In which we meet this quite formidable man who we are told he is 90 years old, but with all 32 of his teeth. Very traditional, in many ways appears quite hard-hearted, but we are told at the end he has a grandson who he is incredibly fond of. And spoilers, it's Marius. So when I return to this book, we will be meeting the title character of this section, Marius Pon Mercy. And he's so exciting. Good evening. I have just finished reading book three, Grandfather and Grandson. So in this book, we're getting even more of an insight and an introduction into Monsieur Guy Normand, as well as his grandson, Marius. Particularly what we're learning from this grandfather figure is how much of an ego he has. He's a very strident royalist, has absolutely no time for Napoleon Bonaparte, often hosts these salons where he gets all of his royalist friends together and they're just making fun of the whole idea of the revolution and Napoleon. There was nowhere he would go unless he could hold sway. There are some people determined at all costs to prevail and to have other people pay attention to them. Where they cannot be oracles, they play the fool. This was not in Monsieur Guillaumant's nature. He was everywhere an oracle. As for Monsieur Guillaumant, his prestige was thoroughly deserved. He had authority because he had authority. Frivolous as he was, and without detracting at all from his jollity, he had a certain manner about him, commanding, dignified, honest, with a bourgeois arrogance, and his great age added to it. 
a man is not a century old with impunity. I like that line, he had authority because he had authority. That's, it's very much like the power is power line from Game of Thrones. <laughs> authority is authority. <laughs> we then find out that the reason that Monsieur Guillaume-Normand has custody of his grandson Marius is because Marius's father was actually a revolutionary. He fought under Napoleon Bonaparte. Once Marius's mother died, the grandfather took sole custody of him and did not allow Marius's father to ever see him. This was despite the fact that Marius's father was desperate for a connection with his son and the best that he could do was to go to the church that the grandfather and grandson would go to every Sunday and just stay in a corner just watching his son. Through this chapter I really get the sense that Victor Hugo is trying to create a parallel between the lives of Cosette and Marius. Marius grew up in obviously much more privileged circumstances however he's somebody who's still growing up with very little love in his life and growing up in a household which basically becomes a prison to him. Madame de T's salon was all that Marius Pommercy knew of the world. It was the only opening through which he could look out on life. It was a gloomy opening and through this small window he received more cold than warmth, more darkness than daylight. And we get to see how he's really unhappy because of his upbringing. When Marius is finally old enough to have contact with his father, it's too late, his father is dying and he does not manage to see his father before he dies. However, after stumbling across a man who knew his father at church, he finds out more about his father and the love that his father had for him, as well as his deeds whilst working for Napoleon. He learns more about the history of the revolution and his father's part in it and armed with this knowledge of history that he never had before. He ends up standing up to his grandfather and his grandfather kicks him out of the house. And we see how Marius becomes a completely different person because just from what he's reading about his father, he knows that he was loved. And that was something he hadn't experienced from growing up with his grandfather was real true love. And it's so powerful that just the knowledge that his father loved him is enough to just reignite something in him and just spark a passion in him. And so as we move on to book four, we'll be seeing how Marius gets on. <laughs> And we're back and here to talk about the final book that I'm going to be discussing in this vlog which is The Friends of the ABC book four. In this book we are introduced to the students who will end up making up the famous rebellion and seeing how young privileged Marius starts to work his way into the society and learn more about these different students whilst not quite being able to ingratiate himself into it because his political views are still kind of taking form and he starts to become quite down and depressed because he has made such a massive life shift by kind of swapping his politics from his grandfather's monarchist views over to his father's Republican Bonapartist views. But actually when he meets young men who are his age who have these completely different ideas that are kind of based in republicanism, kind of based a little bit on Bonaparte, but they don't think that Napoleon Bonaparte went far enough. He, he's so confused, he doesn't know what to do with himself because it's been a massive upheaval in his life and he's realising he's not quite done processing that change. I also felt a lot for Marius when he's first being introduced to the Friends of the ABC and kind of being dumped into this situation where he is surrounded by people who are much more knowledgeable. Maybe they're not more intelligent than him, but they just know a lot more than he does about politics. And I feel like that's just a universal, universal experience is being dropped in a room where you realise that you are the least knowledgeable there and just feeling completely out of your depth. Being there, being there. You know, you get the courage to kind of talk about your own ideas and your own thoughts and opinions and then everyone's just kind of looking at you like, oh, how basic. Which is exactly what happens to Paul Marius. He's seen as not being revolutionary enough. There's a great scene where Marius meets Corferac and Corferac asks him, by the way, have you any political view? Certainly, said Marius, almost offended by the question. What are you? A Bonapartist Democrat. A safe mousy grey, said Corferac. <laughs> Basically, the friends of the ABC think that Marius is just a bit too safe and it's really uprooting him and causing him to kind of draw within himself a lot more. And I can definitely relate to that when you feel like you're not quite fitting in. You can either go down one of two roads, you can either like really immerse yourself in that world or you retreat from it. And I feel like Marius does definitely retreat from these friends because he just doesn't know where he fits in. Also something that's really nice in this book is we are getting much more of an in-depth view on all of the different friends of the ABC. I think if you've only ever seen the musical, you would be forgiven for thinking there's Anjoras, who is the leader, you've got Granta, who's the drunk, and then everybody else who has no identity. But in this Victor Hugo really gives you time with each of these different men and seeing how their personalities are a little bit different from each other, how they complement each other. And yeah, I thought that was really nice and something that you don't really see, I think, in Lamer's adaptations. So with that being said, I think it's time for a little game of Lamer's Tinder. Who are you going to swipe right or left to from the Friends of the ABC? First off, friends, we have Anjolras, the leader of the Friends. Now what you'll notice right away from Anjolras is that he is very intense. In fact, I'm not really sure that he's ready for a relationship. The only thing he has any time for 
for is the idea about a French Republic. Victor Hugo describes him as a man of great passion and intensity. He had only one passion, rightfulness, only one thought to remove any obstacle to it. He's seen as quite a stern character, but also that he can be very charming and he is a beautiful man, which I think checks out because every single actor who has ever been cast as Enjolras has always been really attractive. So, you know, you like stern, intense, passionate guys, then Enjolras is for you. But like I say, I think he's only got eyes for France. Next, we have Confer, who Victor Hugo describes both compliments and is corrective to Enjolras. He has all of the same thoughts of revolution, all the same passion, but he is much more level-headed, much more logical. Confer shared the common experience of life more than did Enjolras. He's more grounded. The sense that you get from him is that he's dedicated, yes, but he's much more level-headed, much wiser than Enjolras, who is much more passionate and fiery. Enjolras was a leader, Confer was a guide. You would have wanted to fight with one and march with another. And then Victor Hugo has this great line describing the difference between Enjolras and Confer. A fire can certainly create a glow, but why not wait for daybreak? A volcano gives light, but dawn gives an even better light. We then have Jean Prouvaire, also known as Jihan, who is described as being even more gentler than Confer. The sense that you get from him is that he's very educated, very good-natured, quite a romantic sort and very soft-spoken. Above all, he was good. Like I say, a very educated man. He knew Italian, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and used this knowledge to read only four poets, Dante, Juvenal, Aeschylus, and Isaiah. He was fond of whiling away his time in the meadows of wild oats and cornflowers, and clouds were almost as much the object as his concern as were events. You know, he's a gentle soul. <laughs> we then have Fui, who we know deeply values education, particularly history. He loves his history. Maybe a guy for me. And that he is very big hearted. Because he taught himself how to read and write, he really provided his own education for himself. He sees education as the big leveler, the big way of being able to free others. We then have Corferac. Corferac, who is described as being very, very similar to Fontaine's lover Felix. Corferac did indeed have the vivacity of spirit that might be called the waggish charm of youth. He is charming and mischievous. However, what Victor Hugo notes is that unlike Felix, Corferac was a decent lad. He is decent, he is kind-hearted, he is a warm spirit. He describes how Enjolras was the leader, Comfer was the guide, Corferac was the centre. The others gave more light, but he gave more warmth. We then have Baharel, who I can only describe as being like the most Gryffindor of the bunch. Baharel was good humoured and disreputable. Brave, spendthrift, generous in his lavishness, eloquent in his chatter, brazen in his audaciousness, damned finest fellow there ever could be, with gaudy waistcoats and fiery opinions. He's a man who really likes to debate and loves nothing more than a bit of a riot, but uh, is maybe not always going to be on the right side of the law. We then have Legle, and we learn that Legle is cheerful, but <laughs> has very bad luck. He had learning and wit, but he was a failure. <laughs> How relatable. But because he is so unlucky, and because it's always inevitable to him that he is going to be unlucky in what he does, he's still cheerful about it. He took his bad luck with equanimity, and smiled at the taunts of fate like someone who could see the joke. The next of the friends that we have is Julie, who is training in medicine, which might seem like quite a catch, but unfortunately Julie is a young hypochondriac. He's often quite nervous, a bit cranky, but he is described by Victor Hugo as being the merriest of the bunch. All these contradictions, being young and cranky, ailing and cheerful, happily coexisted, and the result was an eccentric and delightful individual. And then finally, my friends, we have Grantaire. And I'm not gonna lie to you, Grantaire is not much of a catch. He is described as being a skeptic. He is the only one there who is not really passionate about the aims of the revolution. He doesn't think it's gonna work. He's quite complacent, he spends all day drinking, he really cruelly is described as extremely ugly. <laughs> Mean, mean. However, I do not think that Grantaire would be quite on the market on Tinder because, as Victor Hugo says, this skeptic had one obsession. This obsession was not an idea, nor a dogma, nor an art, nor a science. It was a man. Enjolras. Grantaire admired, loved and revered Enjolras. And the reason that he admires him so much is because of Enjolras's passion and intensity and determination, which Grantaire does not have. With insidious doubt creeping through him, Grantaire loved to watch faith soar in Enjolras. He needed Enjolras. By instinct, he admired his opposite. So I'm sorry, he's not on the market. Though quite unfortunately for Grantaire, it's not really quite a reciprocated love. In his belief, Enjolras looked down on the skeptic and in his sobriety on this drunkard. He spared him a little lordly pity. Grantaire was an unwanted paladise always snubbed by Andrea, spurned, rebuffed, and back again for more. How cruel is unrequited love? <laughs> but yes, friends, let me know which of the friends of the ABC you would be most interested in. Who would you swipe right for? Who would you swipe left? And with that, we come to the end of this week's Les Mis reading vlog. I hope you've enjoyed it. Do let me know how you are getting on with Les Mis. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye!